Okay, I think we should make a start. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Firstly, sorry that we're starting a little bit late, but as you'll appreciate, Achille has arrived in London this afternoon, and uh, ever since he arrived, he's been running around North London, so we've just made it. Apologies, but uh, we're here. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce Achille, for I think it's either the fourth or the fifth time at a Lobby for Cyprus seminar. Uh, those of you who've been involved with Lobby for many years will remember that Lobby has always put the issue of property rights at the centre of its campaign. We were saying this in the mid-1990s, and at the time, not many people were listening to us. I'm glad to say that now, whenever you speak to someone about the Cyprus issue in any of the respective governments, they always say, well, the property issue is at the forefront of the discussions. And that's a big change from the position in the 1990s, I can tell you. Aki, I don't need to tell you about Aki Lazar's track record, but uh, he began with the Loisibo case in, in the late 1990s, which was a stunning success. And he has continued with his litigation in the European Court of Human Rights on the Cyprus issue ever since then. I said in 1998 at one of his seminars at the Hellenic Centre, that I thought Lachie Lairs was about 10 years ahead of his time in terms of the, the campaigning he was doing on Cyprus, really, through the litigation. Um, I think I might have been right. And it's a great privilege for us to have him this evening. Lachie Lairs will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes. After that, we will take whatever questions that you have. Um, I would ask that we, when we ask the questions, please try and keep them short. The only reason I ask that is because if you want a detailed answer from Aguilera's, he can only do so if you ask, ask a short question, because many people want to ask questions tonight. So if we can have short questions, please, we will then get a lengthy answer from Aguilera's, but that way we have as many questions as possible before we have to finish. So, it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Lobby's friend and Cyprus's friend, Aguilera's and the others. Aguilera's. Thank you, Nick. Let me first start by thanking Lobby for inviting me uh, tonight to share some thoughts with you um, about the property rights in occupied Cyprus. Um, I, I think it's important to have these uh, presentations. I think it's more important to have them um, these days. Um, the, the anniversary is on Friday of the invasion, and I think it is important for people uh, to remember that these things happened 34 years ago, but their effects are continuing, and it is not only a political discussion, but also a legal struggle that we have to go through in order to achieve what I believe is the correct uh, result, which is to allow people to return to their homes and properties. So I'd like again to thank Lobby for Cyprus. It's, as, I said, as Nick said, the third, or the fourth or fifth time and every time is as important as the previous one. Um, and I hope I will have the opportunity this evening to share with you these thoughts, not just in the monologue that I will be making the presentation, but also in a dialogue where the, through the interaction we will be able to get to some better understanding of where we stand. So why is property important in Cyprus? I think it is important because it lies to the heart of the Cyprus problem. I think if there's one issue that nobody can deny uh, its importance is the issue of property. Everyone is either a property owner or has a relative who is a property owner. And I think the smaller your country, the bigger your love for your property. The more you identify yourself with the property you grew up with, you cultivated, you lived, and you aspire to return to. I think that encapsulates the feelings that Cypriots have for their property and it is important to stress that because without understanding the connection that people have with their property, you cannot understand their stubbornness and their resistance in wanting to return and wanting to have a restoration to their rights. So having said that, in order to describe the issue, I want to get into the details of the presentation which is entitled Property Rights in Occupied Cyprus, an update from the European Court of Human Rights. Um, 
I, I will make the update, but you will allow me to make an introduction as well, because uh, some of you may not be aware of all the details relating to these cases, uh, which over the years, and now we are on year, well, we started in 89, so you can do the number, uh, we are proceeding with this effort, which I think has proved successful, in that it is now common ground to discuss the property issue. Back in 89, when this was started, or when the cases were going through, as Nick has said, when we talked about property, people were looking at us thinking, what are these people talking about? What are they on about? I mean, what is property? How important is it? Well, it is important, because it is the building block upon which our society is created, and it is the biggest aspiration that people have in, in not being refugees anymore. So how did it all start? It started with a method called an individual petition before the European Court of Human Rights. It all started with Mrs. Loizidu back in 1989, uh, when she decided that she had to do something about her property which was in occupied Kyrenia. So she decided to bring an action before the European Commission of Human Rights, as it then was, claiming that it was Turkey that was depriving her of the right to use a land. It is a human right to be able to enjoy your possessions and it is violated by Turkey who is not allowing people like Mrs. Loizidu to go back to her property and enjoy that possession that her father or grandfather had passed on to her. The procedure through the court was, uh, to, was, was quite time consuming, but the reason for that was because a lot of new issues were created. Uh, Turkey had been stubborn in its opposition, and fortunately we were blessed with judgments which uh, vindicated our position, but not just for the Cypriots. The rights that have been established and the case law that has been generated is not just for the Cypriots, it is for everyone in Europe and indeed for all the world. What I think is interesting for the Loisido judgment, and something that must be stressed, is the approach taken by Mrs. Loisido. She decided that instead of claiming for an amount of money for the expropriation of her property, or the loss of her property, she decided to do it the hard way. She said, the property still belongs to me. I do not accept that Turkey, by virtue of its occupation, has caused the loss of title to this property and therefore it belongs to me. And then she took a very bold step. She said, not only does this property belong to me, but you are responsible for not being allowed access to it, but more importantly, you are responsible for the loss that has been brought about to me because I cannot use my property. For example, if it was a field, she could claim ground rent. If it was an apartment, she could claim rent. If it was a shop, again, she could claim rent. It is important to distinguish cases like Luizidu from others where the claim is not for expropriation. It is a claim for loss of use. For the loss of the rent, she would have had, had Turkey not taken over the property. This means that these rents, even though they may be small in number, are repeated every year and continue to be due for every year that occupation uh, continues. So that was the procedure she chose. She started off in 89. I will not bore you with all the details. But the bottom line was that in 1998, a judgment came out in which the violation had been established and an award for compensation was made. I must point out that the Loisido judgment is not only important in establishing that uh, ownership still remains with Greek Cypriots, it is also very important in international law because it established that a state that controls a territory is also responsible for human rights violations that happened there. So any human rights violations that take place in the occupied part of Cyprus are attributable to Turkey. There is no independent state. The TRNC is a subordinate local administration, subordinate to Turkey, 
local because it has no international uh, personality and an administration because yes it is an administration people have a system of government but that system do not be fooled has no international recognition and it is local there have been other efforts after Luizidu, notably the interstate application, the fourth interstate application by Cyprus versus Turkey. This has been a case law which ended up in May 2001 with a judgment by the European Court of Human Rights in which the Republic of Cyprus was the plaintiff and Turkey was the defendant. Surprisingly, the court confirmed the findings of Luizidu in addition to other issues relating to missing persons, enclaved and voting rights. That is important because in terms of procedure, we are now waiting the judgment, the, the position of the Cyprus government as to whether or not they will be proceeding with a claim for damages. But that is for the future. Let me come back to Loizidu as to where we stand now. Contrary to popular belief, Mrs. Loizidu has been paid her compensation. In fact, in December 2003, she actually collected an amount of over 640,000 Cyprus pounds, not for the expropriation of her property, but as a measure of loss of use. That amount included costs, but reflected the inability of Mrs. Loizidu to peacefully enjoy her property in occupied Kyrenia. The fact that Turkey paid was the end of phase one of the exercise. It was the result of the collective enforcement mechanism uh, of the Council of Europe, whereby member states of the Council of Europe come together under the auspices of the um, uh, committee, uh, of the committee where all the uh, ambassadors take place, and participate and which has an obligation to supervise the execution of judgments. It is important to understand this concept because it is here that judgments have a power of their own. And it is no longer the individual, Mrs. Loizidu, that is fighting Turkey. Once judgment is passed by the European Court, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe undertakes collectively to ensure that enforcement of these judgments is brought about. It then becomes the business of the Committee of Ministers for Turkey to comply with the judgment. And it is no longer the individual that is fighting Turkey, but it is the system that is fighting Turkey, because if Turkey does not comply, and for that matter any other country does not comply, it is the system that we lose. So it is important to preserve the integrity of the system and that is why in December 2003, after a number of political uh, pressures generated by the committee, Turkey actually paid up the amount with interest. That concluded phase one of the exercise. Phase two of the exercise is still in progress and phase two requires that Turkey should allow Mrs. Loizidu to enjoy the rights for which a violation has been established. This means that Turkey must allow Mrs. Loizidu to return to her hometown of Kyrenia. Yet, Turkey has, has not offered to this day any excuse as to why it has not allowed Mrs. Loizidu to return. I can tell you it is not a threat to Turkish national security if Mrs. Loizidu goes back to Kyrenia. Yet Cyprus has, as Turkey, excuse me, has failed to give any explanation. And in fact, in October, at the forthcoming meeting of the Committee of Ministers, once again the issue of non-compliance with the requirement of restoration of Mrs. Loizidu's property rights will be on the agenda of the Committee of Ministers and Turkey will have to explain why this has not taken place. The third level of enforcement, which becomes even more difficult, 
is that anybody in Mrs. Loizidu's category should enjoy the same rights. That is to say, anybody who has lost his home or the property or his property should be entitled to restoration. That, of course, is a long way. What I think is closer is Mrs. Loizidu's ability to be restored to the property, and that will close phase two of the exercise. There has been some more case law since. Um, there have been cases uh, by individuals, notably Evgenia Mikhailidis versus Turkey and Dimadis versus Turkey, where in 2003 violations were established. Uh, the first one relates to a property in Kyrenia where the Turkish army is occupying, and the second relates to a large property near Timbu, uh, where again a violation was established. Those two cases are awaiting the compensation amount to be adjudicated. The court was faced with a number of cases. There are now about 1,500 of these cases pending before the court. So, as it is the practice now developing, decided to designate a case as a pilot case. The, no the idea behind that is that instead of trying 1,500 <coughs> cases uh, every time, they would establish the principle and then ask the state, which was found uh, guilty, to fix that which has caused the violation. That at least is the principle. And the court is trying to develop this concept because it is not coping with the cases that have been filed before it. The system is not coping with the numbers of cases filed. And so the system had to devise methods whereby it would lower the burden. This was one of them, and they chose the Xenidas Arestis uh, case uh, against Turkey as the pilot case. This is quite interesting because the admissibility decision um, was a very important one. It had to deal with issues uh, in relation to the rejection of the Annan plan by the Greek Cypriots and the acceptance by the Turkish Cypriots. There were questions put to the parties which in effect had to justify the position taken by the Greek Cypriot community. And you'll be glad to hear that the rejection of the Annan plan did not in any way change the legal position. I am referring to these points because these are not political arguments that were made. These are findings in law which are binding on the parties. And that um, part of it is very important. Also, Turkey decided to create a compensation commission because it wanted to create a system within the occupied area which would force Greek Cypriots to go through before applying to Strasbourg. Let me take a step back and explain how this works. In Strasbourg, in order to apply to the European Court, you need to exhaust domestic remedies. That means that you have to go through the court system of your country, apply to the first instance, and then apply to the Court of Appeal, and then perhaps apply to the highest authority within your country in order to get satisfaction for the alleged violation. This, in the case of Loisidu, did not take place because in the occupied side there was not even access for Mrs. Loisidu to go to the occupied area, so it was not an issue. Nevertheless, in the Arrestis case, in April 2004, having had partial restoration of the right of freedom of movement after April 2003, that issue was something that Turkey had taken on very seriously. They had also set up this commission alleging that it was an effective remedy to which Greek Cypriots had to apply. A lot of arguments were presented to the court about the illegality, invalidity, and non-compliance of this mechanism with the European Convention of Human Rights at the admissibility level. And the court only looked at the arguments relating to the composition of this committee. Evidence had been put before the court by the Cyprus government, who had joined the application in support of Mrs. Xenides Arestis, to the effect that most, if not all, of the members of this commission were in fact living in houses belonging to Greek Cypriots. 
how on earth would anybody applying to this commission had any chance of a fair hearing? How would a judge that had a personal interest in the determination of the case be allowed to give a fair opinion? That was taken very seriously by the European Court, which rejected this commission on the basis of its composition. Then we went to the second stage of the uh, examination of the case, which relates to the merits. That was not that difficult, since the Loisilu judgment had already established the principle that Turkey was responsible for the violations, that uh, Mrs. Arestik Senidis was the owner of the land in, in point, and therefore a violation had been established. What is interesting and often forgotten about Xenidis' case is that it relates to the fenced-up city of Famagusta. Now, the fenced-up city of Famagusta is very interesting from a legal point of view because it is occupied by the Turkish army and yet nobody is allowed access. That is the story you all know. The story most of you do not know is that ever since independence, the Turkish Cypriot community has been maintaining a position that Famagusta, most of Famagusta, actually belongs to FGAF. FGAF being the religious foundation of the Muslims. And it derives its argument from, sorry, it derives authority for this argument from a theory that that part of Cyprus belonged to a Turkish Pasha who then passed on the property to his ancestors, and at some point the British government did something wrong to the Turkish Cypriot community, and in effect took away the property and gave it to the Greek Cypriots. Now, whether there is merit or not in that argument, I will not discuss in detail. I will only refer you to the treaty of establishment, where there is a compensation amount of about one and a half million Cyprus pounds, paid over to the Turkish Cypriot community in full and final settlement of the various property claims to the British crown. That conveniently has been forgotten and some people say that it did not reach the community itself but only some people of the Turkish Cypriot community who may have used or misused that amount. The point though is that the Turkish Cypriots have always, been, have always maintained this position and it was the first time that we had a chance to rebut these arguments. And the rebuttal was very simple. We suggested to the Turkish government that if they have any paperwork evidencing this allegation, they should present it. Because we had presented our title deeds, which had been recognized by the court in Loisidu, and the Turkish government had presented nothing. Their argument was that in 1974, once they had taken control, or once they had taken over control of Famagusta, they found the books of the land registration office in one of the hotels of Kennedy Avenue, and in those books, for the first time, they discovered that this land belonged to FCAF. To our challenge to produce the books and the evidence uh, substantiating their claim, they did not reply and gave a number of legal arguments which, interestingly enough, were considered by the court and were rejected. It is important to remember that this rejection by the court is now binding on Turkey and I believe that it will have a very difficult case to reopen the issue of FGAF in relation to the fenced up city or the rest of Famagusta. That is quite important. So judgment was issued and violation was found. And thereafter, a procedure uh, for establishing the amount of the award uh, took place. Uh, at that time, Turkey made an offer to the applicant, Mrs. Xenides, um, for about 250,000 pounds for loss of use of her home and part of an orchard, as well as 250,000 pounds to give up ownership of her rights. To her credit, she rejected both offers and requested the court to proceed with awarding the amount of compensation. Her claim was in the region of 750,000 pounds for loss of use and the court in the end 
awarded 800,000 euro, which is about half a million Cyprus pounds, which in effect is the medium between 750 and 250, and also an amount of 50,000 euros for moral damages. They also awarded a cost, which was very nice, for 35,000 euros. At that point, there was a discussion in Cyprus whether there was a need for a referral of this case to the Grand Chamber. The notion of referral is in a way an appeal type of procedure, and the argument was whether this referral should be made or not, and the basis of that were certain remarks made by the court in the judgment issued in December 2003 in relation to this compensation commission. The court statement was in effect that it had welcomed the creation of this compensation commission in principle, and it did not go further to examine the illegality, um, incompatibility with the convention and the ineffectiveness. And that argument was felt by a number of circles not to be in our favor and that we should have uh, filed for a referral. Indeed, a referral was made uh, raising a number of issues, not so much on this point, but a number of procedural issues in relation to the pilot scheme that the court had put in place. And also, strangely enough, the Turkish government filed a, repair, a referral as well, as we understand, in order to reopen the question of the uh, FGAF argument, as well as the level of damages. The level of damages is very high. For them, the benchmark is now really high, and the actual values generated by that, if one were to do the numbers, brings up the claim in billions of pounds that Turkey has to pay for the fenced-up city of Famagusta alone. The court, in its infinite wisdom, decided not to examine the, the case, and therefore the, the, the judgment became final. That means that Turkey has until the 22nd of August, uh, that's about a month from today, to pay up the 885,000 uh, euros. And thereafter, uh, the second level or the second phase of the, uh, of the judgment will commence. And that is the effort by Mrs. Arestis Senidis to return to the fenced up city of Famagusta. I want to pause at this point because I think it is important to stress uh, the legal implication of this judgment. So far, we have been fighting for the return of Famagusta on the basis of our political arguments, of arguments of violation of human rights. It is the first time that we have a solid judgment relating to the fenced up city which requires Turkey to allow Mrs. Xenides to return to the fenced up city. Not just Mrs. Xenides, but anybody from the fenced up city. And I think this judgment lends a hand to the efforts by the municipality of Pomagusta with its campaign that has started with the collection of signatures and presentation to the European Parliament and other international organizations to say that it is not just a political question of returning to Famagusta. It is a legal requirement. It is simply the enforcement of the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights in which Turkey participated, had their trial, and lost. We are not simply asking for a political position or the political view of this matter. We are demanding the enforcement of a judgment and we are claiming, rightly in my view, that not just Mrs. Arestic Senidis, but everybody else in her category should be allowed to return to their properties, not just within the fenced up area, but also within the rest of the occupied area of Cyprus. In October, in the forthcoming October, the matter will be put before the Committee of Ministers, and slowly but surely we shall increase the pressure on Turkey so that after it has paid the money in August, we shall start to push for the restoration of Mrs. Xenidis' right to return to her home and orchard in the fenced up area. Last case I want to refer from the European Court of Human Rights is Dimadis versus Turkey. 
it may very well be that Dimadis versus Turkey <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> may become the next pilot case. It is in the system, it is one of the oldest cases pending, and the court will have inevitably to consider again the question of the illegality, ineffectiveness and incompatibility of the Compensation Commission. Um, I believe that if it does take on this case, we shall have the same result as before, we shall prevail in that the Commission, the commission set up is not effective and not compatible with the Convention. It is important to understand that the efforts by Turkey to set up this Commission in itself is a success. The fact that Turkey feels the need to set up this Commission means that we have succeeded in making them understand that what they're doing is wrong and that they're trying to find a way to remedy that. The, the way they have so far found is not adequate and they shall keep on trying in order to be able to provide people some sort of remedy which will be of the standard required by the European Court. So far this committee is sub-standard. But there is another point which people tend to forget, and that is we are talking about Turkey. There is nothing else but Turkey. Turkey itself has derecognized the TMC. Turkey's position is that this Compensation Commission is a Turkish remedy. It is a Turkish domestic remedy. That confirms our view that what is happening in the North is simply occupation and there is nothing else that would prevent the characterization of that military presence as such. Efforts for a friendly settlement in the Dimaris case were made. There was an offer by the Compensation Committee uh, to Mr. Dimaris but there is a sad story on that, and in a way it reflects what's happening in Cyprus lately. On the 13th of September 2006, we received in our office a letter from the Compensation Commission offering Mr. Dimalis 240, if I'm not mistaken, thousand pounds for compensation for loss of use and an amount for compensation for expropriation. The sad thing is that on the 12th of September 2006, Mr. Dimalis died. <coughs> he had a heart attack. And he was not fortunate to see that his efforts had actually bear fruit in that Turkey felt obliged to try and settle this matter because they knew that he would prevail. The effort continues through his heirs and I am hopeful that they will be able to um, get the money that their father would have got in this pursuit he has commenced. It is an unfortunate fact that Mr. Dimalis died because it shows that time is passing on, is, is continuing and people should start thinking from a long view on the matter. I think looking at it only from the point of view of making an application is important, but also looking at it from the point of view of the heirs of the property is important as well. But perhaps we'll leave that in our discussion. Last, because I think I need to finish in three minutes. No, no, no. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Another case which does not relate to the European Court, but I think is equally important, and you, which you have had a lot of experience uh, of, is the Apostolidis versus Orams case. That is distinct from the cases which I have described because that relates to a case between an individual, Mr. Apostolidis, owner of land and a house in Labithos, against Orams, which are a family that is trespassing upon Mr. Apostolidis' land. Here is an action between one individual against another. 
in the Loisidu, in the Dimadis, in the Arestis case, the case is brought by an individual, but it is directed against the Turkish state. And the forum for that is the European Court. The forum for this is initially the courts in Cyprus, in this case, the District Court of Kyrenia, which temporarily is housed with the District Court of Kyrenia, which will hear the case, and in fact, hear the case. Now, the logic of this case is that if there is a trespass and you secure judgment, then that judgment can be taken and brought to another European country because of the European law, and you can enforce that judgment in that country, assuming there are assets belonging to the defendant. In this case, it had been identified that Mr. and Mrs. Orams owned, owned property in England, and that's why there was an effort to register the judgment and then execute the judgment in relation to these assets in satisfaction of the judgment debt. For various technical reasons, which I will not get into, the effort failed and the matter was appealed. In that appeal, the Lord Chief Justice referred the case to the European Court of Justice because there is a difficult issue of European law that has to be considered. The question is put simply, whether judgments issued by Cyprus courts but relating to property in the occupied by Turkey area of the Republic in which the European law does not apply can take advantage of the provisions of European law and become enforceable in other <coughs> European countries. That is a technical question whose result is of great importance. It will take another 12 to 18 months to have that decision, which will then be referred back to the English court, which will deal with the matter. This, though, signifies another type of effort that one can undertake, as long as the defendant is a European citizen. Because if, for example, it is a Turkish company, it will be very difficult to secure a Cyprus judgment and then try and execute it in Turkey for obvious reasons. But if, for example, we have a German defendant or an Italian defendant and judgment is secure against them, then that judgment from the Cyprus court, once of course it has gone through appeal, can be taken to Italy, to Germany, to France, and it can be executed on assets belonging to these persons. For example, if you owe your bank money, the bank gets a judgment, and it then comes and takes your house or your car. It is exactly the same logic that is applied here, but across national boundaries. That approach has been used on a person-to-person -person case by Mr. Apostolidis, and it is distinct from the cases of a person against Turkey. Um, we'll be glad to hear that I've finished. I just want to make a conclusion. Looking at all these cases, I often wonder why. Why bother? I mean, Loisilu started in 1989. We are now in 2007. Is it important? Is it useful? Should we do these cases? I've thought about it a lot, and I, I really want to share with you, uh, to share with you this, which perhaps you may agree with me. The important thing in these cases is that it is direct evidence of the efforts of the applicants to return to their properties. It is confirmation that these people still care about their properties and they are taking whatever steps they can in order to assure that by claiming these properties they assert their right that they continue to be owners and that they want to return. If you do not take any action, then that may be construed as being your impression of not really trying for your property or not wanting to return, even though that's not true. That may be a conclusion that someone can reach. 
if you do take some action of this nature, then there is no doubt that you are claiming return and you are asserting your rights for these properties, not for yourselves, essentially, but more importantly for the next generation as a debt to the previous generation that has passed it on to your fathers. I think if you look at these cases after, I don't know, 18 years of doing them, I think that's the message, that if you take the do-nothing option, you are simply giving up your property in this way. My view is that the properties must be uh, dealt with through a system of claims in order to ensure that there is evidence that these people are claiming their properties and there is also an opportunity to record from people who are now becoming very old information that is disappearing. The other day I took a statement from a 93 year old refugee. How much longer do you think he will live? Yet now I have his affidavit. He described every single property he gave me details of the crops he had from every land. We have details of the incomes that he, he used to get. And this will be the basis of a claim that will be made against Turkey now, later, long, long afterwards. It doesn't matter. It is there. It is recorded. There is an independent record in Strasbourg which says that these people are the owners. And even if they take over the rest of Cyprus, this independent record is there and it will haunt them forever. Thank you. Thank you, Angelina, for a, a, a very, very interesting presentation. I, le I learned so much from that. I thought I knew something about these cases, but I learned at least four new things tonight.